In this episode, we will look into the feature that was completely missing in iteration 1, namely the expansion boards. As you may remember, the expansion boards are physically attached to the backplane boards, and the interface between the main board and the expansion boards constitute the expansion board bus. There are two different aspects to this interface that we need to consider, the physical and the logical part. The physical interface consists of 36 tracks running along the two backplane boards and is exposed to the expansion board through a series of header connectors. The connectors serve two purposes, to supply power and to be a means of communication between the main board and the expansion boards. The bus is therefore made up from three power rails, a ground and 32 signals. There is a 5 volt rail which powers all the logic but there are also two 12 volt rails. The plus minus 12 volt power is intended for analog signal processing, making it possible to, for instance, implementing an RS-232 communication card. As you may have noted, there is no power solution at all in this computer. In order to keep things simple, the power is actually supplied through an expansion board. The power connector will be attached to the backside. The AC to DC conversion is done in an external unit and the three DC voltages are supplied through the board and into the computer. Let's turn our attention to the communication part. There are a few familiar members of the bus like the 8 data bits, the 16 address bits and the read-write signal. These work in the usual way. To keep the system as simple as possible and to keep the number of signals below 36, there is a design decision that the expansion cards are not allowed to write to or read from system memory. This means that there can be only one bus master in the running system and that is the CPU. However, when the system is in halt mode, the user takes the role of the CPU and thus becomes effectively the bus master. An expansion board, however, is never a bus master. This implies that they are passive in the sense that it is the CPU, or the user, that copies information to and from the card. Since the boards never issue a read or write operation to system memory, they never drive the address bus. They do have to respond to reads, however, which means that they need to drive the data bus occasionally. This may lead to a conflict since the whole memory is mapped to a SRAM, and thus the main board memory may respond to the same read request. They would then both be driving the data bus, and that is something that we cannot allow. The solution is to assign specific memory spaces to the expansion boards. When a write operation hits such a memory space, the expansion board takes precedence over the system memory, that is, the system memory backs off and does not drive the data bus in such a situation. This is the mechanism that I talked about in an earlier episode, and then I refer to it as address space overloading. The overloaded address space is the one controlled by a board. But exactly how does the system memory decoder know that an expansion board intends to drive the data bus? The solution is extremely primitive. It's a wired OR solution. There is a CDD signal on the bus that the main board pulls high with a resistor. Whenever an expansion board detects that the current address is within its memory range, it pulls this signal down to ground to indicate it intends to write on the bus. CDD stands for Card Drives Data Bus. However, this simplistic method does not cover the case where there are two different cards with overlapping address spaces. They would be in conflict with each other, and this needs to be solved with some other means. We will talk about a partial solution to this problem in a moment, but first we will finish the physical interface. Since the cards are passive and cannot write to memory, they need a way to tell the processor that some kind of attention or action is required. The signals IRQ and NMI are two signals that provide such a mechanism. Like CDD, the main board pulls them high and any expansion board may pull them down at any time to generate an interrupt or a non-maskable interrupt of the processor. The last signals on the bus are the card address signals, CA0 through CA3. They indicate which backplane slot the card is inserted in, and the possible ranges is from 0 to 15. Let's have a look at the logical part of the expansion board bus interface. 
to at its some extent solve the problem with overlapping memory spaces, each board has a specific range through which it can be controlled. This is called the controlled memory space and each board has 8 bytes allocated in the range starting at FF00 and ends in FF7F. The reason for not going higher is the conflict with the CPU reset and interrupt vectors higher up in memory. The control space address is determined by the number of the slot that the card is inserted in, that is the card address. The control space of board 0 starts at FF00, board 1 starts at FF08 and so on. This division makes sure that no two control spaces can be in conflict. This is the partial solution however. It is not foolproof, as we shall see in a moment. Before we go into the actual contents of the control space, we need to think a little bit about what the expansion boards are going to be used for. It is easy to imagine boards for serial communication and cassette storage. Such boards probably have very limited use of large memory spaces. A typical serial port would only need a byte for reading, one for writing, and a few for configuration. That might fit well into the 8-byte control space. However, another board type, which definitely not fits into that range, is a ROM board. A basic interpreter can easily occupy 10 kilobytes. So the control space approach would not work for such a board. And other boards like graphics probably also need several kilobytes of address space. To handle the need for larger memory spaces, another mechanism is required. These memory spaces will most probably vary in size and maybe also in position. This means that each board needs an optional data space aside from the control space. This data space may have an arbitrary size and position. The logic must be constructed such that the CDD signal is triggered when the data space or the control space is accessed. Now we can go into the control space definition. It consists of 8 bytes. Since the board can be installed in an arbitrary slot, the CPU cannot know which board that actually is installed into a given slot without some kind of identifier. Byte 0 is therefore an 8-bit identifier. This gives room for 256 different types of boards, which should be enough for everyone. Byte 1 is a control byte, which contains 6 bits controlling the behavior of the board. Bit 0 controls whether the data space is active or not, for instance, if a program would wish to remove the basic interpreter provided by a ROM board and use the underlying RAM instead, this bit would be set to disable the data space and cleared if it is to be re-enabled. Bit 1 indicates whether this particular board has generated an interrupt, and it does that by setting it to 1. This bit should be cleared by the CPU when the interrupt is handled. Bit 2 works in the same manner but for non-maskable interrupts. With bit 3 and bit 4, one can enable and disable the board's capability to generate interrupts. When this is set to 1, the board may pull down the respective bus signal, but when it's set to 0, it is not allowed to do that. Bit 5 indicates that this particular board actually has a data space, and bits 6 and 7 are reserved for future use. Bytes 2 through 5 are registered for reading the start position and the size of the data space. Nothing prevents ambitious boards to implement writing of the start position, but given the discrete logic size, I don't think that would leave much space on the board for the actual function. Bytes 6 and 7 are card specific control registers. If the board does not have a data space at all, and thus declaring bit 5 in byte 1 to be 0, then all the bytes 2 through 7 are available for board specific use. This should be enough for simple cards such as serial communication. Here is a schematic of a generic board address decoder and control logic. To implement this on a board, it will take a fair share of the board space, so I expect most boards to implement only a few of them. I regard most of the bytes in the control space to be optional. To test this expansion board concept, I will build a simple board the so-called reset vector board. It will have a limited version of the control space and a data space only containing the two reset vectors FFFC and FFFD so that we do not need to manually enter these every time we start a computer. Two DIP switches will code these values for us. We will go through this design in the next episode. We will draw some schematic, do some layout and send it off to PCB production. 
See you next time.